Hello, and welcome to the 2021 A Company of Fools production of The Rule of Three. These short plays by Agatha Christie will take you on a journey through mystery and discovery with a patient and a detective and a pair of adulterous lovers and a framed murder. You will first see the patient, then there will be a short documentary entitled When the Curtain Fell, followed by the performance of The Rats. After watching the performance, we encourage you to donate to actingforothers.co.uk, which offers financial and emotional support to creative professionals in the theatre industry during this time of need. Also, to view your free digital programme, please visit pse.ac.uk forward slash cof dash show. The filming, production and the rehearsals of tonight's shows have all followed government and college guidelines regarding COVID-19. To find out more, please visit our website at pse.ac.uk forward slash cof. Enjoy the show. Inspector Craig, good. Ask him to come up to room 14, will you? Yes. How are you doing, Madison? Got it fixed up? Yeah, everything's in order. I'll play it here. Mm, yeah. We're quite sure about this now. We can't afford to have a slip up. What is this thing? New electrical gadget? Oh, one of those. Trouble with you people is you've no respect for science. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Inspector. Everything's ready. Is this a contraption? Good afternoon, Inspector. Yes, it's been well tested. It should work perfectly. The slightest touch should make a connection. All right, Madison. We'll call you when we need you. You say the others have arrived? They're downstairs. All four of them? All four of them. Brian Wingfield, uh, Emmeline Ross, William Ross and Brenda Jackson. They can't leave, I've posted my men. Mm. You must understand, Inspector, that the well-being of my patient comes before anything else. At the first sign of excitement or collapse, any indication that the experiment is having an adverse effect, I shall stop the proceedings. You understand that, nurse? Yes, Doctor. Quite so, quite so. I wouldn't expect anything else. But, Doctor, you, you don't think it's too risky? If I thought it was too risky, I should not permit the experiment. Mrs. Wingfield's heart, pulse, and temperature are all now normal. Uh, Nurse Bond, you are acquainted with the family. Go down to the waiting room and bring them up here. If they ask any questions, be strictly non-committal in your answers. Well, here we go. Yes. Let's hope we have luck. Have any of them been allowed to see her? Her brother and sister, naturally and also her husband. Um, Mrs. Wingfield has, Mrs. Jackson has not asked to see Mrs. Wingfield, nor asked to do so. Quite so. Uh, Doctor, you'll, you'll give them a little preliminary talk, will you? Uh, put them in the picture. Certainly, if you wish. I see that Mrs. Wingfield fell from the second story balcony. Yes, yes, she did. Remarkable, really, that she wasn't killed. Dislocation of the shoulder, fracture of the right leg, and head contusions. Ah, oh, Mr. Ross, good afternoon. Mr. Ross, will you sit down? Good afternoon, Mr. Wingfield. Well, you sent for us. It's not, it's not going to do my wife, right? But there's no bad news, surely? No, Mr. Wingfield, there's no bad news. Thank God. When you sent for us, I, I thought there might be a change for the worse. There is no change of any kind. 
Neither for the worse, nor alas for the better. Is my sister still unconscious? She is still completely paralysed. She cannot move or speak. It's terrible. Simply terrible. Was Miss Jackson with you? Oh, she was following us. No. Oh, Dr Ginsburg, my secretary. Miss Jackson. Good afternoon. Oh, poor Jenny. What a horrible thing to happen to anybody. Sometimes I feel you better if you killed outright by the fool. No. Anything but that. I know how you feel, Bright, but this is a living death, isn't it, Doctor? There's still some hope for your sister yet, Mr. Ross. But, but she won't stay like this. I mean, she, she will get better, won't she? In cases of this kind, it's very difficult to forecast the nature of a patient. Her injuries will heal, yes. The bones will knit. The dislocation has already been reduced, and her head injuries are healing. Well, then why shouldn't she just be Jenny again in every way? You are touching on a subject which we are still very ignorant. Mrs. Wingfield's state of paralysis due to shock. The result of her accident. The accident was the ostensible cause, yes. What do you mean by ostensible? Mrs. Wingfield must have suffered some unusual fears before she fell from the second story balcony. It's not so much her physical injuries, but her mental state that have caused this state of paralysis. Wait. You're not trying to say, no, no, no. You're not trying to say what I'm sure the inspector here has more or less been suggesting. That my wife tried to commit suicide. You know, I don't believe that for a minute. I never said I thought that it was suicide, Mr. Wingfield. Well, you know, you should think something of the kind, shouldn't you? Or else you and your people wouldn't keep hanging around like bloody vultures. Now, we have to be quite clear as to the cause of this accident. My God, isn't it simple enough? She's been feeling ill for weeks, feeling weak. She's taken for the first time, and frankly the first time, goes to the balcony, leans over, loses the balance, falls to the ground. Don't get so excited, William. Don't shout. I know how you feel, buddy, but this business makes me all mad. How do you feel with the police making out of your family affairs? Bill, if anyone should be mad, it's me, and I'm not. What exactly have you been asked to come here for? One moment, Miss Jackson. Miss Ross, I wish you could tell me a little more about your sister. Was she at all prone to fits of melancholy, uh, depression? She was always highly strung, nervous. Oh, I wouldn't say that at all. Men don't realise these things. I know what I'm talking about, and I think it is quite possible, Inspector, that her illness left her particularly low and depressed, and that was other things she had to worry and distress her. Miss Jackson, where do you think you're going? I'm leaving. I'm not one of the family, and... I was asked to come here with the others, but if all you're going to do is go over and over again about the accident, whether it was an accident or an attempted suicide, well, I don't see why I should stay. Dr Ginsburg will explain. Sit down, Miss Jackson. Dr Ginsburg. I had better perhaps recapitulate what I know or have been told. Mrs Wingfield has been suffering from an illness somewhat mysterious in nature that was puzzling the doctor in attendance on her, Dr Horsfield. This I have on the authority of Dr Horsfield himself. She was, however, showing decided signs of improvement and was convalescent, though there was still a nurse in the house. On the day in question, exactly ten days ago, after seeing her patient had all she needed, Nurse Bond settled the patient in an easy chair near the open window, it being a fine, mild afternoon. She had some books and a small radio beside her. And about half past three, a cry was heard. Miss Ross, who was in the room below, saw a falling body cross the window. It was the body of Mrs. Wingfield, who had fallen from the balcony above. There was no one with her in the room at the time, but there were four people in the house. The four people gathered here today. Mr. Wingfield, would you mind telling us again, in your own words, what happened that afternoon? Well, I thought I should have told it often enough. I was correcting the proofs in my study. Then I heard a noise. It was a scream from outside. I rushed to the side door. I go to the balcony. I lean over and I see and I see Jenny. Emmeline joined me a moment later, and then Bill, and then Miss Jackson. Emmeline phoned for an ambulance, and I, I... Yes, yes, Mr. Wingfield, there's no need to go into any more. Miss Jackson, will you tell us your side of events? I had been asked to look up a reference in the encyclopedia for Mr. Wingfield. I was, I was in the library, and I heard a commotion, and running, so I dropped the book and joined them out on the terrace. And Mr Ross? Oh, 
I was playing golf all morning. I played golf every Saturday. I'd come home, eat in a hearty lunch, and I was feeling quite whacked. So I went upstairs and laid in my bed. It was it was Jenny's scream that woke me up. I looked on the, down on the terrace, and there was someone down below. I joined them not long after. Oh my god, do we have to go this again and again? I only wanted to stress the point that nobody who was in the house could tell us exactly what happened that afternoon. Nobody that is except Mrs. Wingfield herself. It was a perfectly simple accident that I lost the entire time. Jenny thought she was stronger than she was, leaned down on the balcony, and lost her balance. It could happen to anyone. Somebody would have been with her, really. I blame myself for that. But she was supposed to rest in the afternoon, Brian. That was part of the doctor's orders. We were all going to meet her at half past four for tea, and she was supposed to rest every day from three o'clock until then. Miss Ross, the accident seems a little difficult to explain. The railings on the balcony did not give way. The railings are very low. I tested them myself. But Mrs. Wingfield is a very small woman. It would not be so easy for her to overbalance, even if she were taking giddy. I hate to say it, but I think you're right in what you suspect. I think poor Jenny was worried and troubled in her mind. I think a bit of depression came over her. You keep saying it like she tried to commit suicide, okay? I don't believe it. I won't believe it. She had plenty to make her depressed. And what do you mean by that? I think you know quite well what I mean. I'm not blind, Brian! Jenny wasn't depressed. She had nothing to be depressed about you. I've got a sick mind, Emmeline, and you're just imagining things. Leave my sister alone! It was an accident. Of course it was an accident, Miss Ross. Was just trying to. Yes, what am I trying to do? It's women like you that write anonymous letters or poison pen letters just because no man has ever looked at you. How dare you! My God, women! Cut it out! Both of you! Right. I think we're all just getting a little. Overexcited here. We're all just saying things that are quite besides the point. What we want to really get at is what Jenny's state of mind was the day she fell. And now, I'm her husband. I know her pretty well. And I don't believe for a moment that she tried to commit suicide. That's because you don't want to think so. You don't want to feel responsible. Responsible? What do you mean responsible? For driving her to do what she did! How and dare you! That is why my wife goes to do that! Please, quiet! When I asked you to come here today, it was not my object to provoke recriminations. Wasn't it? I'm not so sure. No. What I had in mind was to conduct an experiment. Yes, we've already been told that, but we still don't know what kind of experiment. As Inspector Cray has just said, only one person knows what happened that afternoon. Mrs. Wingfield herself. And she can't tell us. It's too bad. She will when she's better. I don't think you quite understand the medical position here, Miss Ross. It may be months, it may even be years, before Mrs. Wingfield comes out of this state. Surely not. Yes, Mr. Wingfield. I won't go into a lot of medical details, but there are people who have gone blind as a result of severe shock, and have not regained their sight for 15 to 20 years. There are those who are paralysed and unable to walk for the same periods of time. Sometimes the shock precipitates the recovery, but there's no fixed rule. I don't understand what you're driving at, Doctor. You're about to find out, Mr. Wingfield. Nurse, do you mind? Yes. What, what, what's going on? What, what are you trying to do? As I have said, Mrs. Wingfield is completely paralysed. She cannot move or speak, but we are all agreed that she knows what happened to her that afternoon. But, but she's unconscious. She may be unconscious for, for years, you said. I did not say unconscious. Mrs. Wingfield cannot move or speak, but she can see and hear. I think it's highly probable her mind's as keen as it ever was. She you knows what happened to her that afternoon. She would like to tell us, but she can't. You think she can hear us? You think she's trying to understand what we're trying to say to her, what we're all feeling? I think she knows. Jenny, darling, can you hear me? It's been terrible for you, I know, but everything will be all right. I said Mrs. Wingfield cannot communicate with us, but it is possible we have been found. Dr. Zalsbergen, a specialist in this form of paralysis and who has been looking after Mrs. Wingfield, became aware of a very slight power of movement in her left hand. The left finger and thumb are able to move. It is very slight, hardly noticeable. She cannot move or lift anything, but she can slightly move the thumb and left finger of her left hand. 
Dr. Lanson here has fixed up an apparatus of an electrical nature. You see, there is a small rubber bulb. When pressed, it will appear a red light at the top of the apparatus. The slightest pressure will operate it. Now, I'm going to ask Mrs. Wingfield some questions. What do you mean, questions? Questions about what? Questions about what happened that Saturday afternoon. This is your doing, isn't it? The experiment was suggested by Lanson and myself. But surely there's no way you put a possible reliance on what might purely be a muscle spasm. I think we can soon find out whether Mrs. Wingfield can answer questions. No, I won't allow you to go on with this. It's dangerous for her. It will set her recovery back. I think you must allow me to assure you that her health will be fully safeguarded. No, I said the least sign of collapse, you know what to do. I don't like this. Well, of course, you don't like it. Do you? I think it might be interesting. No, that's not fair at all to say. Quiet! Yes. We must have absolute silence. The doctor's about to begin. Mrs. Wingfield, you have had a very narrow escape from death and are now well on the way to recovery. Your injuries are healing. We know that you are paralysed and cannot move or speak. What I want from you is this. If you can understand what I'm saying to you, will you move your fingers and press the bulb? You have understood and heard what I'm saying to you? I think then it must be clear to you all that Mrs. Wingfield can understand what I'm saying. Now what I propose is this. When the answer to a question is yes, you will press the bulb once. When the answer to a question is no, you will press it why? twice. Mrs. Wingfield, what is the signal for no? I think then it must be clear to you all that Mrs. Wingfield has understood what I'm saying to you and can answer my questions. Now, Mrs. Wingfield, I'm going back to the afternoon of Saturday the 14th. Have you a clear recollection of what happened to you that afternoon? As far as possible, I will ask you questions that save you too much fatigue. I'm assuming, therefore, that you had lunch and no spawns, yes or do, near the open window. You were alone in the room and were supposed to rest until 4.30. Am I correct? Did you, in fact, sleep a little? And then you woke up. You went out to the window. You lost your balance and fell. Just a minute, nurse. You fell, but you did not lose your balance. You were giddy, felt faint. Inspector, I hope you... <clears throat> what I propose is this. I will go through the letters of the alphabet. When I come to the letter of the word you need, Press the button. Do you understand? I'll begin. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, you have given me the letter P. Mrs. Wingfield, I'm going to hazard a guess. Is the word that you have in mind pushed? I've got no, no you can't write Why? It's impossible. Please, I can't have the patient agitated. Mrs. Wingfield, you clearly have more to tell us. I'll begin again. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, M. That M is probably followed by a vowel. Which vowel, Mrs. Wingfield? A, E, I, O, U, and U. Mrs. Wingfield, I'm going to hazard a guess. Are you trying to tell us that some unknown person came into the house? Are you trying to tell us it was an attempted murder? This is outrageous, I tell you. This can't be true! Quiet. She doesn't know what she's saying. I think she does. Mrs. Wakefield, was it someone inside the house who pushed you? Doctor, her pulse is quickening. Not much further, Doctor. We must have a name. Well, I'll go through the letters again, Mrs. Wakefield. A, B, You've given me the letter B? Doctor, she's collapsed! I oh, dare go on, it's no good. Give me the steriliser. Is she all right? She'll be all right, yes. She must rest for a while. 
We should take her near the open window. She'll be all right there. Well, there's not much doubt, is there? Who she meant? B. Not much doubt about that, is there, Brian? You've always hated me, Emmeline. You've always had it in for me, but I can tell you, I did not try and kill my wife. Jude and I were having an affair with that woman there. It's not true. Don't say that. You were head over heels in love with him. All right. Fine. I was in love with him. That's over. It was ages ago, but he didn't really love me. It's over. I tell you, it's all over. Well, then it appears odd you stayed on as his secretary. I didn't want to leave. I... I still wanted to be near him. Perhaps you thought that if you got poor Jenny out of the way, you could console him very nicely and become Mrs. Wingfield number two. Emmeline, for heaven's sake! Perhaps it's B for Brenda. You horrible woman, I hate you. It's not true. B, Brian or Brenda, now it's down to one of you two, all right? I wouldn't say that. Could be B for brother, couldn't it? Or Bill. She always called me William. After all, who stands to gain from poor Jenny's death? And it's not me, I tell you. It is you. You and your sister. You two get our money after all. Please, quiet, please. I cannot have all this arguing. Nurse, will you assist them down to the waiting room? Yes, Doctor. We can't stay cooped up in this room slanging each other off all afternoon. Very well. You may run the hospital grounds as you please, but none of you is to actually leave the place. Is that understood? All right, yes. I have no wish to leave. My conscience is clear. I think you did it. What do you mean? You hate her. You've always hated her. And you get the money. You and your brother. My name does not begin with B, I'm thankful to say. No, but it needn't. Supposing, supposing that Mrs. Winfield didn't see who it was who pushed her into the balcony. But she told us that she did. But supposing that she didn't. Don't you see? Don't you see what a temptation it would be for her? She knew about me and Brian. So when that machine there gave her the, gave her the opportunity to get back at us, get back at me. It could have been like that. It could. A little far-fetched, Miss Jackson. No, it isn't. Not for a jealous woman. You don't know what women are like when they're jealous. She'd been sat in her room, cooped up, wondering, thinking, Suspecting if Brian and I are still going on together. It isn't far-fetched, I tell you. It could easily be true. It is quite possible, Inspector. And you do hate her. Me? My own sister? I've seen the way you look at her often. You were in love with Brian. He was half engaged to you and Jenny came from abroad and cut you out. I think you've hated her ever since. You've not forgiven her. So, you came into her room that day, you saw her leaning over the balcony, and it was too good an opportunity to miss. You came up behind her, and you pushed her over. Give me Spectre, can't she stop this kind of thing? I don't know that I want to, Miss Ross. I find it all very informative. Nurse Bond, will you please escort them to the waiting room? Yes, Doctor. Miss Ross. Would you mind waiting a moment? Well, what is it? There are some questions that I'd like to put to you about your brother, but I didn't want to embarrass him. Embarrass William? You don't know him. He has no self-respect at all. Never ashamed to admit he doesn't even know where to turn from the next penny. That's very interesting, Miss Ross, but he's actually your brother-in-law. I thought I'd be concerned about the questions. Oh, Brian, what would you like to know? Miss Ross. You know the family very well. A woman of your intelligence would not be deceived as to what went on in there. You know the lives of your brother-in-law and your sister and what relations were like between them. Now, it is reasonable that up to this point you would say as little as you could. But, seeing as you know the circumstances have changed only a moment or two ago, well, that alters matters, doesn't it? Yes, I suppose it does. What would you like me to tell you? This affair between Mr. Wingfield and Miss Jackson, was it serious? Not on his part. His affairs never are. You mean there actually was an affair? Well, of course. You heard her. She's as good as admitted it. 
Do you know this to your own knowledge? I could tell you various details to prove it, but I do not propose to do so. You'll have to take my word for it. Very well. It started when? Nearly a year ago. And Miss Wingfield found out about it? Yes. What was her reaction? She taxed Brian with it. And he? He denied it, of course. Told her she was imagining things. You know what men are. Lie that we're out of anything. But... He, she wanted him to send the girl away, but he wouldn't. Said she was far too good a secretary to lose. But Mrs Wingfield was very unhappy about it. Very. Unhappy enough to want to take her own life? Not if she'd been well and strong. Her illness got her down. She got all kinds of fancies. What kind of fancies, Miss Ross? Just fancies. Miss Ross, why was Miss Wingfield left alone that afternoon? For some reason she preferred it. One of us always offered to sit with her, but she had her radio and her books. For some reason she preferred to be alone. And whose idea was it to send a nurse off duty? Ah, oh, that's private nursing. That's standard practice. She would have had two hours off every afternoon. All right. And in reference to the affair between uh, Miss Jackson and Mr. Wingfield, uh, Miss Jackson says it was all over ages ago. Was that not the case? Perhaps they broke off for a while, or they were being more careful. But at the time of the accident, they were back on. Oh, yes. You seem very sure of that. Well, I lived in the same house, didn't I? In fact, I have something to show you. I found it in the big Ming vase on the hall table. It appears they were using it as a post box. Darling, we must be careful. I think she suspects us from B. It's Brian's handwriting, all right. So, you see? Do you mind if I ask a question or two, Inspector? Of course. Miss Ross, I'm interested in those fancies you mentioned. You had some particular fancy in mind, I think. It was just sick women's imaginings. She was ill, you see, and she felt she wasn't making the progress she needed to. She said so to you? She was just upset. She thought there was a reason for that. She thought the two of you were poisoning her. That's it, isn't it? Yes. She said so to you? Yes. And what did you say? I don't know what you mean. I, I, I just told her it was sick women's imaginings. And what actions did you take? What do you mean? Well, did you speak to the doctor in attending on her? Take samples of her food? Of course not. It was just nonsense. Well, it happens more than you know. Right. Arsenic poisoning. It's almost always arsenic. These symptoms are practically indistinguishable from those of gastric disorder. Right, he, he couldn't. He just couldn't. She could. Well, I suppose. We'll never know now. Oh, that's why you're quite wrong, Miss Ross. There are always ways of telling. There are fibres in the hair and under the fingernails that can be tested. I, I don't believe... I don't believe with Brian. Inspector, do you need me any longer? No, Miss Ross. I'll keep this as evidence. Yes, of course. Well, we got something. From the Ming vase in the hall. Interesting. It's his writing? Yes, it's Brian Wingfield's handwriting, all right. You know, he was quite one for the ladies. Pulled them over like nine pins. Unfortunately, they always took him too seriously. Doesn't strike me as the Casanova type, writing all those history novels, very erudite. <laughs> There's quite a lot of dirt in history. So it wasn't all over. In yep. addition to what we had already, what did you have? Get four people all het up and accusing each other. Take a malicious and embittered woman and invite her to spill the beans. Gives on some material to work on, doesn't it? So there's more to the story? I went into the financial angle. Brian Wingfield's a poor man. His wife's a rich woman. Now, her money came to her in trust. It's not for a very large sum, but enough for, her, enough for him to remarry if he wanted to. Now, if she dies childless, the money would be split between her brother and her sister. The brother's a wastrel, always begging his sister for the next penny, until one day, Brian tells me, he, she said, no more. She wasn't going to pay him. Though, I dare say she would have done, in the end. So which is it? 
B for Brian, B for Brother Bill, Emmeline will have to be. Emmeline. Emmeline would have to be Emmeline. Wait a minute. It was something they said. They were. It was. It was this afternoon. They were all hidden here. They were. They were bickering. No, no, it's gone. Could it be B for burglar? No, that's definitely out. We've got conclusive evidence on that point. We had a constable positioned in front of the house. The front and side gate were directly under his eye. Nobody entered or left the house that afternoon. You know, you asked me to cooperate, but you've been very careful not to put your cards on the table. Come on, what do you think? It's not a question of thinking, Doctor. I know. What? Well, at least I think I know. You think it over. You've got seven minutes. What? Ah, yes. Mrs Wingfield, thank you for your help. We've come now to the crucial point in the experiment. Mrs Wingfield, we are about to leave you here, apparently unguarded. None of the suspects know that you have, in fact, regained your powers of speech since yesterday. They also don't know the fact that you are unaware of who pushed you off that balcony. Do you realise what this means? One of them, one of them will try to... Someone will almost certainly enter this room. Are you sure you want to go through with this, Mrs Wingfield? Yes, yes, I must know. I must know who... It's all right. We should be close at hand. Just remember, if anybody approaches you or tries to touch you... I know what to do. Thank you, Mrs Wingfield. You're a wonderful woman. We only need you to be brave for a few moments longer, then we shall trap our killer. Ready? Right. Inspector, in light of these new poisoning allegations, perhaps you'd like to take a look in my office at the files once more? Yes, and I'd like another look at those x-ray plates too, if I may. Help! Help! It's all right, Miss Swingfield, we're here. Help! Murder! Is she all right? Yes, she's all right. You've been very brave, Mrs Wingfield. Thank you. Mrs. Wingfield, that note in the Ming vase was all I needed. Brian Wingfield didn't have to write secret notes to a secretary he saw every day. No, he wrote those notes to someone else. And that constable on duty, he swears that nobody entered or left the house that afternoon. So, you didn't go for your off-duty walk that day, did you? You may come out from behind the contraption now, nurse Bond. Hi, I'm Libby and I'm one of this year's A Company of Fools directors. Due to COVID-19, the theatre industry has been hit incredibly hard. And so we thought it was important for you to hear what the arts mean to us and why they are so crucial. 
For me, performance has limitless possibilities. It can be used for escapism, education, to offer hope and to spark creativity. The theatre inspires me every day, and I thought this quote perfectly sums up the power of the arts. We must all do theatre, to find out who we are and to discover who we could become. Hi, I'm Sam and I'm also one of the directors of this year's The Company of Fools. Um, outside of college, I'm really fortunate to act as the youth chairman at Mayflower Theatre and Mars Studios. Um, and it's been really devastating to see the impacts that coronavirus has taken on theatres and arts um, venues, both small and large across the country. Now, theatre is not necessarily an industry that I want to go into as a career, but for me, it does provide a wealth of opportunities to escape normality, to push the boundaries of live performance and to engage audiences on a whole new level. Hi there, I'm Freddie. Surprisingly, I am one of the directors here at the Company of Fools. Theatre, for me, has been an important part of my life for years. It's the reason I am who I am today. Today, I am confident. Today, I am... I have meaning. Today, I am creative. And I owe that all to the theatre. But theatre isn't just what happens on the stage. It's the safety. It's the emotion. It's the new friends every show. It's the camaraderie between performers. And when COVID came, we were left without all of this. Hey, I'm Tilly, another one of our esteemed directors. A little joke for you there, by the way. Um, so I chose to study both drama and performing arts at college. So obviously when COVID hit back in March, I was kind of just thrown like far out of my comfort zone. Um, from what I was used to, I'm just kind of at this point very, I'm always in the drama studio, you know? And I think one thing that I noticed is it's just a very different, it's really impossible to create the kind of highly energetic and highly emotional at points um, atmosphere that you have in, in a drama studio, you know, kind of bouncing ideas off each other, chatting with our teachers. Um, so I would say that what I've missed most is being able to be surrounded by other performers and just share your ideas. We have recognised the joy that the arts have brought us this year and felt that it was very important now more than ever to give back. During this difficult year, the arts have allowed people to feel connected and get together even when they are miles apart. The theatre industry has been an important part of igniting hope and carrying everyone through an incredibly tough time. And now it's time for us to say thank you to them. Due to lockdown, theatres have been shut and thousands of creative professionals have been left unemployed and struggling financially. By donating to Acting for Others, you're providing financial and emotional support to all theatre workers in times of need. We've seen the difference the arts can make to people's lives firsthand and want to make sure that they can continue to do so for years to come. But while some theatres remain shut and others are running on limited capacities, public donations are vital in ensuring that theatres can continue to spark joy and imagination. We have enjoyed being a part of a company of fools so much and thought that it would be nice for you to hear the cast talk about what the arts mean to them. For me, the arts are all about having fun, being creative and getting to relax. Hi, my name's Karis and I play Alec in The Rats. Um, the arts have been important to me my entire life. Um, I play guitar and piano and I sing. So I've done a lot of musical theatre before, but Simmons and A Company of Fools has really just taken me into proper theatre acting and dialogue learning. And I'm really enjoying it and I can't wait to put on the show for everyone. To me is the opportunity to meet new people and try new things. I've been doing performing arts since I was four and I can honestly say it's made me into the person I am today. It's helped me with my confidence, helped me when talking to people and I can say I've met some of my best friends through performing arts and drama. Art is so important for me for two reasons. It's collaboration and it's permanence. I mean Agatha Christie wrote this play 58 years ago and the tension still holds up so well and I hope you find that's the case for you too. Thank you. Hi, I'm Molly and I love the arts because I've loved acting for as long as I can remember. I've wanted to do it as a job for as long as I can remember and I just think it's amazing that you can put yourself in other people's shoes and understand other people's situations and just live multiple different lives. 
I love performing arts. It's such an amazing opportunity. The feeling that you get when you're on stage working alongside loads of new people and directors and actors, it's just incredible. I love performing because it's helped me build my confidence loads over the years and it's helped me make lots of new friends, especially in college. It was a great way to branch out and meet new people. Um, and it's a really nice relaxation for me because I take quite academic subjects. What's my favourite thing about doing drama? Uh, it's definitely be able to mess around on stage and it be acceptable. What does the performing arts mean to me? To me, it's simple. I love entertaining and I love acting. And using that, I can bring entertainment through my acting. Whether I'm on stage or on screen, I can give insight, I can give some enjoyment to people. Because that's what it's all about to me, is making joy. Hi, I'm Izzy and drama is so important to me. I think before theatre and drama, I was quite a timid child. I hadn't really found my thing or my people. And drama gave me the opportunity to express myself within a character that wasn't me. And that really heightened my own self-confidence. I think I really just fell in love with the feeling of being on stage. There is nothing more exhilarating than that feeling. You just can't beat it. We need to protect the drama industry because there are so many talented people out there who deserve the opportunity to express themselves and to show the world their talent. I think drama is really good at bringing about discussions and debates and without drama we don't have the opportunity to share things that people might not have thought about before. It's so, so important. I love acting because it just gives me that freedom, you know, I can just completely step out my own life and just become something else, you know. When I'm on the stage, you just get this rush, like a mixture of adrenaline and emotion, it's just, it's just powerful. We are also lucky enough to have actor Kevin Brewer working as a teacher here at Simmons and asked him to talk to us about the power of the arts and why it is so important to donate. Hello, my name is Kevin Brewer and I am a professional actor. Um, I graduated from drama school in 2016 and I went to uh, Lambda, which is the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art. Um, I did the three year course there, the VA Ons, um, and it was something that I always, always wanted to do. Yeah, like I said, acting is something I've always loved. Um, I just love uh, the, the freedom it brings to you um, and the, the, the play, the natural kind of energy of um, being able to, to investigate roles and um, emotions and um, yeah, like I mentioned before, freedom to do what you want to do. Then leaving drama school, I was very fortunate to uh, go into a show which did a mini tour and then straight into the West End. So. I did a couple of stints in the West End for a while, which again was a dream, dream come true. Um, did uh, a couple of feature films, did some stuff in that, did some film and telly. Um, and it, with the pandemic and everything that's happened at the moment, it's really kind of brought into focus how important uh, art is and keeping art going. Um, without sounding pretentious, um, it really is the most important thing in the world and the, the least important thing in the world. Um, because at the time it feels like it's an important thing, um, but actually it isn't the most important thing because there are things like doctors and nurses and, and people doing these incredible jobs. But what you do through your art um, is give them some respite. So if you go and uh, if, you, if you've done a film or a play or something that they, they can then go and see and take their mind off what they're doing, I feel that that's your kind of offering um, as, as your artist to, 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 the, to the wider world. So, um, Acting for Others is a cause that's uh, close to my heart. Um, the show I was in uh, a couple of years back was called The Wipers Times and we collected for it at the end of every show. We were very fortunate to win a, a Golden Bucket Award. Uh, for the most collected regionally. Uh, they invited us to this lovely ceremony and um, that's when I really understood the power of, of this charity because um, it's, there, was a, there was a gentleman there who had um, uh, fallen on hard times through different, different um, circumstances and um, didn't have any means of income and he had two little kids um, and told this really incredible heartbreaking story um, about 
uh, this happening and how he's going to pay pay rent and, and all of the above and acting for others stepped in and really helped him and, and helped his family um, and it, it's a really hard industry uh, because you don't have a lot of safety nets you're out there your body is your money really um, so you, you put yourself out there um, and it's an incredible charity because they they become that net for a lot of people and help them so uh, particularly at this time um, with COVID and the pandemic it's it's a, a, a time where a lot of people are in trouble uh, financially um, kind of people who are, are now going out of the industry to do other things um, which is an unbelievable shame because there's there's a, a plethora of wonderful performers out there from different walks of life and we're going to be missing out on those stories without those people. So um, Acting for Others um, is a, a charity that really does um, really does help the wider, wider community. If you're kind enough to want to donate, the website is on the screen and in the programme. It's www.actingforothers.co.uk. Click and donate and choose your selected amount. Is as easy. I hope you enjoyed the patient and the performance of the rats will begin shortly. What are you doing here? I'm like you, too early for the party. It's always so shaming to be early, isn't it? What's this about a party? Whose party? Well, oh, not the party exactly. Francis just said to come in for drinks. They asked you for drinks today? Yes, isn't that why you're here? Not exactly. Why shouldn't the Torrances ask me in for drinks? No reason at all. If they'd been in England. Do you mean they're not in England? They're at Juan. But Pat Torrance ran back on Tuesday, the day before yesterday. Did she? Yes! Really, darling, you must do better than that. It's no good sticking to a story that won't gel. <laughs> really, Jennifer. I suppose you got Pat Torrance to lend you a key to the flat. And you're meeting someone here. Who is it? You might as well just tell me, or shall I try and guess? I've already told you. Pat Torrance asked me to come. Perhaps she asked you to be the budgie? I mean, I think that she did mention something about... Oh, but I already agreed to feed the little brute for her. How forgetful of Pat to ask two of us to do the same thing. Really, oh, Jennifer. Now, don't lose your temper. I'm only teasing. It's so lovely catching one's friends out. But you might just tell me who he is. I swear I'll be as silent as a grave. I am not expecting to meet anyone. You're really not expecting to meet anyone? The only person I'm expecting to meet here is John. Your husband? Yes, he said he'd join me as soon as he could get away from the office. Dear John, such a pet, isn't he? Naturally, I think so. Such a kind, simple, trusting man. He simply worships you, doesn't he? He doesn't actually dislike me. 
What a splendid understatement. Men don't usually dislike you, do they? Quite the contrary. Hadn't you better speak above you if that's really what you're here for? Jennifer. No. Sandra. You suggested that I came here to meet someone. Certainly not. I'd never dream of such a thing. That would be a really bitchy thing to say. Tweet, tweet, tweet. Here you are then. Love a bud for the budgie. You know, there's something rather non-you about budgie. Wouldn't you agree? Well, I suppose there's something rather non-you about the Torrances. All this travelling about to strange places and bringing back souvenir. I stole an ashtray from the Carlton and Cannes once, but I never forgave myself. And why only one bird? Why not two? Look at the poor little mite all shut up in, in on itself and simply pining for a mate. Though I suppose, if there were two of you, you'd have to be faithful, wouldn't you? Such a bore. My God, he drank his own weight in water since this morning. Never mind, Mother will get you some more. Or do you suppose he'd rather have gin? If it is a he, how can you tell? Well, if it is a he, how can you tell? Oh, he has to be faithful. Blah, blah, blah. She's going on. What are you doing, darling? Oh, nothing. Anyways, that's my chore done for the day. I'm going. Goodbye, Sandra. I might as well come with you. No point in my staying all this thing. What about John? He'll be coming. John, you can... I expect that to now. Hello, Sandra. David. Hello. Hello. Uh, Mr. Forrester, this is Bryce. How do you do? How do you do? You seem to be much too early for the party, David. Like me? Oh, really? That seems to make her three of us. <laughs> I just came to be the budgie. Oh, I see. Nice little fellow. Um, does he talk? <laughs> Only Swahili. Very expressive language, I've um, always understood. Right. Well, that's me done. It's lovely to see you, Sandra. And give my love to David, won't you? It's been the greatest fun. Who the devil was that? Jennifer Bryce. Friend of yours? I wouldn't say so. Whose flat are we in anyway? The Torrances. It's very nice and suitable. Does this open into a double? Yes, I think so. That's kind of it. Sandra. David! It's been quite a while. All of a week. Has it been long for you too? An age. I wish you didn't have to be so secretive, all this plotting and planning. It's such a bore. Oh, we do. It won't always be like this, but just for now. That woman. Damn awkward her butting in like that. What does she think? About us? Yes. Well, oh, she'll think go away and talk it. What damn bad luck. We've been so careful up to now. I, I told her I was expecting to meet John here. Did she believe you? She might have done if you hadn't walked in. As I said, damn bad luck. I must say, you did a good job of looking surprised. I was surprised. But how could you have been when you asked me to come? I didn't ask you to come. You didn't? No. But I got a message. What message? Would I meet Mrs. Gray at 513 Holbrook Mansions at 630? This is Holbrook Mansions, isn't it? Yes. Well then. I must say, there's something very queer about all of this. Patricia Torrance rang me up on Tuesday, the day before yesterday. But uh, they said that they went to the south of France on Saturday. She rang you up herself. It, it wasn't a message. No, it was her. At least I thought it was. But now you're not so sure. I don't know her awfully well. She just answered the phone saying, that's where I was speaking, it just didn't occur to me that it wasn't her. Something behind all this, I don't understand. Me either, I don't like it. But what's the point of it all? Ringing you up, pretending to be Taff Pat Torrance, getting you to come here, getting me to come here, by sending me a message supposedly from you. What does it all add up to? Well, I wondered if... You've got some idea about it. Tell me. It might not be, but I wondered if maybe it was John. John? Well, 
I began to think you suspected that. You never told me. I thought I was probably imagining it. John. But how had he tied with the Torrances? Could he have got this Torrance woman to ring you up and... That's absurd. He hardly knows her. He might have got someone or other to lend him, lend him, lend him the flat and pretend to be the Torrances. But why? My dear girl, use your head to catch us in the act. Le Grand Delicto. Oh, I see. Probably got a couple of bowler hatted private detectives hiding in the back room. Couldn't even hide a bowler hat in there. This place bears your hand. Probably needs to come here himself and surprise us in our amorous play. What a beastly, disgusting thing to do. No point taking such a high moral tone, darling. After all, a husband is justified, I suppose, in being annoyed to find his wife has taken a lover. How long have you two been married now? Three years. And old John is still inclined to be on the jealous side, eh? Of course he's jealous. You know that. But he's also frightfully simple. Anyone could deceive him. I was quite sure he didn't have a clue up until recently. I suppose some kind friend has been around to tell him the good news. Though, I must say, we have always been careful. Somebody always knows. Yes. Well, in that case, I think the best thing to be done is to beat a hasty retreat. We'll meet tomorrow at the usual place, but be sure you're not followed. We certainly can't risk anyone. Get your things! Go on! The door, it's open! I wish I'd put the damn catch down. For God's sake, try and relax. Have a cigarette. Go on, Alec. Darlings, how devastating. We three could be much too early to the party. So there is a party then. We were just wondering. No, but it doesn't much look like it, does it? No canapes, no baked meats, no olives. I suppose the party is here. The torrents are giving it somewhere else, are they? Well, we wondered. How long have you two been here? Oh, um, I came five minutes ago and Theo's just arrived. Oh. So you two didn't come together? No. No. Pat Torrance rang you up, did she? No, it was Michael, as a matter of fact. Rather vague chap. Don't know him all that well, but he just said, when I roll along here for a drink, 6 cents for him onwards, so here I am. All dressed up. I've been to the garden party, my dear. The people nowadays. Anyways, I figured this was going to be quite a do. Did Michael say so? No, he just said drinks, but there are ways of saying things. Oh, there's something. Do you know right? There seems to be some tonic. Yes, fine. I'm sure you want to celebrate. Well, it's quite clear what's happened. The Torrances are giving a party, but they're giving it somewhere else. And either they thought we knew, or they simply forgot to say. Peculiar, isn't it? I mean, that someone should have forgotten to say so to all three of us. Well, absent friends seem to be the right toast. To the Torrances. The Torrances. Somebody. It was Jennifer Bright, as a matter of fact. Said the Torrances were away. I didn't believe it, but now I wonder. Well, it's rather odd, isn't it? Because, no, wait a minute, let me work it all out. The Torrances have gone away. Somebody else, we don't know who, has asked us three to come here. But why? Exciting, isn't it? Quite like one of those mysteries in books. Perhaps want us to hunt around for a clue. It'll take us on to the next place. Really? What extraordinary things the Torrances have. I suppose they brought this back with them from Baghdad. What a strange nose it's got. Yes, cruel. Darling, that's very penetrating of you. It is cruel. But it's odd, isn't it? This whole flat looks rather cruel to me. So bare and cold. These four walls that hold you in for just a minimum of necessities to live in it. What a terrible place to be shut up in if you couldn't get out. It's a perfectly ordinary modern flat, Alec. Don't go thinking things up. Oh, David. We don't have any pleasant imaginings. Oh, this wasn't a Damascus bride chest. Seems to have a worm in it. 
Oh, and here's one of those bloodthirsty knives you stabbed your wife with to be unfaithful. Is it in there on the hilt, well, isn't it, David? Well, go on, take it. Won't well, bite you. Yes. Splendid. You're so inartistic. Do you think it's nice, Sandra? Oh, um, yes, rather beautiful. Now, what's out here? Five floors up, what a drop. Might be a cliff in Cornwall. Perfect for suicide. Oh, I've dropped it. The knife, I've dropped it. Not anyone's head, fortunately. But I suppose I'll have to go down and get it. What a bore. While I'm down there, I'll see if I can find a porter. I don't think there is one. Well, there must be an officer, or a manager, or a manageress. I'll just pop in, see if Trance's gone away, and if they've let this flat to anyone. Well, we might as well all No! Be you stay here. Finish your drinks. Make yourself at home. I shan't be long. Of course. That ass would turn up here. He's got the most malicious tongue in London. Do you think he thought it was strange, the two of us being here together? Oh, I bet he did. Now he'll go around everywhere telling people that we've got the chances to lend us their flat to meet him while they're away. Then we better go. No. If we go off together, it will look bad. Isn't Alec rather a friend of John's? In a way. The person Alec was truly devoted to was my first husband, Barry. He was terribly upset when he died. The fuss he'd made, anyone would think I pushed him. Did you? I jolly nearly went over myself. The whole cliff subsided after a heavy rain. It was terrifying. So, Alec doesn't like you very much then? I don't think Alec likes any woman very much. But he particularly doesn't like you. What are you getting at? I just wondered if it could be Alec that's behind all this. Getting us here, I mean. Then why should he come here? That ruins the whole point of the thing. Yes, yes, you're right. Anyway, we might as well go join friend Alec down below. I must say, I'd like to get the explanation for all of this. It seems very queer how we're all here at the same time. This door's locked. No, it can't be. We've got in quite easily. I accept, expect the Yale's just No, slip. it's not the Yale. There's another lock below. I think that's locked. It can't be. We've got in quite easily. Someone seems to have locked it from the outside. Locked us in, do you mean? Yes. But that's absurd. We've only got to shout. <sighs> no, wait a minute. We've got to think this out first. There's something very odd going on. It may be Alec, or it may be someone else. Somebody got you here, pretending to be the Torrances. Somebody got me here, apparently sending me a message from you. But what does it all add up to? The sooner we call their bluff, the better. We'll make a hell of a round pass off as a joke. I tell you, I can't afford a scandal. If John would bring divorce proceedings out, it'd be the end. What a selfish brute you are. What about me? What about my reputation? You never had much of one. <gasps> Sit down. <sighs> Let me think. Yes, yes. Somebody laid a trap for us and we're caught in it. We've got to think of the best way out. You still think it was John? I don't believe it. It's Alec I'm thinking of. Alec hates my guts. Always has. Suppose that Alec worked upon John and... What is it? What is it? Sawdust. A little heap of... Sawdust. These holes. They're not wormholes. They've been drilled. Four little round holes. Air holes so that someone could breathe. You mean someone's been here this whole time? They've heard everything we've said, that they've... I think, I think, I think it's quite possible. My God! What is it? What is it? Don't, don't look inside. Tell me! Come, sit down. I've got to think this out. It's John. John? He's in that chest. John. And he's dead. He's dead. He's been killed. Did you do it? Did I what? Did you kill John? No. But you were here when I arrived. You sent me the message. I could just as well say that you did it. Killed John, went away, waited for me to arrive and came back. 
Oh, don't talk such rot. The problem with you is you're so damn stupid. Oh, it's all coming out now, isn't it? None of that famous charm. You're a louse. That's what you are. A louse and a rat. What about you? How many men have you hopped into bed with? I should like to know. You bastard, you filthy rotten bastard. <coughs> Who do you think? I don't know. It's probably Alec. <coughs> if it was Alec, he'll probably come up and check. I don't think it was Alec. Who do you think it was? I don't know, I don't know. I've got to think. We've got to think clearly. Somebody got us here. Somebody got John here. Somebody has locked us in from the outside. Alec, Alec, it must be Alec. But why should he come here? Doesn't that ruin the whole point of the thing? He had to, he had to set us up like this. Do you not see all of this? I don't see, I don't see anything. It's like a nightmare. It must be Alec. He told John that we two were gonna meet here. He suggested that John should hide in the chest. Then he killed him. He left him there. He waited for us to come back. He drew our attention to that knife. He gave it to me to hold, made me take it. Then you took it. Our fingerprints are on that knife and there's not a damn thing we can do about it. We can only wait for the police to arrive. The police? Why did the police arrive? Don't you see that naturally that's the next thing that's bound to happen? Next stage in Alex's plan. We can tell them, we can explain. Idiot! He will simply deny the whole thing. He had gloves on the entire time he was here. He'll deny ever having been near the place. Someone must have seen him come in. In a rabbit warren like this? I doubt it. We can explain. What the hell good will that do us? Someone will come, let us out, and then they'll find the body. And there we shall be, hauled in for murder with a defence so fantastic, no counsel would ever listen to it. My God! He even told that Bryce woman you expected to meet John here! There must be a fire escape or something. In the corridor outside, I dare say. But from here, there's nothing but sheer drop. The phone! We could call someone up! Yes! Yes, of course! Why didn't I think of that earlier? Who could we call? What could we say? <coughs> answer it! Answer it! For God's sake, it can't be worse than this! Yes, yes, I think you're right there. Who is it? It's Alec. What did he say? He said... He said we're caught like rats in a trap. Like the rats we are. And that in three or four minutes, the, the police would be arriving. The police! There must be some way out! There must! The only way out is through that window and down! Suicide! You're mad! They won't listen to what we say. We'll be charged with murder. We'll be convicted. No, we'll explain. They'll find out that Alec was here. What are you trying to do, you little fool? <sighs> Claw your way out. Claw your way out. There must be some way out. Oh, I hate the sight of you, I tell you. I hate the sight of you. You bloody little bitch. You got me into this. I did. for me. It's you they should be coming for, not me. You killed Barry, not me. Why the hell should I get involved? We're caught, we're caught like rats in a trap. Like rats in a trap. <laughs>